So, Lord, I pray that uh, you would help us to preach. I pray that you would cause us to see your face, Lord God. I pray that you would help us to understand what we need to understand. I, who could understand you? But I pray that you'd help us to see your face. Uh, I ask this, Lord God, in Jesus' name, amen. Along about, uh, I think it was about second grade, I learned about germs. Uh, I learned about germs at school. They even showed us pictures of these microscopic entities, invisible to the human eye, and yet deadly in their effect. I learned that they lurked in uncleanness and decay, and most of all, the very pinnacle of human depravity, human excreta. Imagine my um, horror. These unseen germs fed on life and produced death. I discovered they were all around us, on toilet seats and doorknobs and just floating in the air. But not only were they all around us, they actually came out of us. <laughs> And, and like them, we fed on life, and we pooped death, and more germs. I mean, that's, think about that, that's horrifying. You deny it, you do. But you know it's true. Everybody in this room has this like place or outlet on, on their body. It happens almost every day, sometimes multiple times a day even at fancy restaurants. They have these rooms called restrooms, but nobody rests there in those restrooms. You know what they do, it's what you do in those rooms. Well, in second grade I learned about germs and I began to wash my hands a lot. I developed an elaborate system for using and then leaving public restrooms. Toilet paper on the seat, flushing with my, my foot, then getting out of the stall with my elbow, going to the sink closest to the door, using a towel to turn the faucet on, wash my hands, then not touch anything, but using the towel once again uh, to reach over to the door, open the door using the towel, then hold the door open with my foot and put the towel in the proper receptacle. So I wouldn't touch anything that might have touched something or someone that might have touched someone that, that, that touched some possible human excreta. I washed often and I washed very well, but never seemed to be finished. How could I be finished? I am the producer of human excreta and so are you. I was driven, I was driven to cleanliness and before long I was driven to the doctor because all the soap and water had chapped my hands so severely that they have become literally, this is a true story, open oozing wounds, <laughs> susceptible to infection, and that means more germs, more germs. I was worse off then than when I had not the knowledge of cleanliness and germs. I remember the doctor, he looked at my bleeding hands and he said, Stop, just stop washing your hands. Stop washing your hands. And that's what my mom and dad had told me, very same thing. It was what they told me to do and it was just what I couldn't seem to do because the more I tried to forget about germs, the more I thought about germs. And the more I wanted to wash my hands, which made me more susceptible to germs, which made me think about germs, which made me wash my hands. It was just like trying to you know, quit smoking or Quit drinking so much. The more you think about not, um, about not drinking, the more you, you want to drink, and then, then the more you're susceptible to getting a drink. It's like going on a diet. The more you think about not eating donuts, the more you think about donuts, and the hungrier you get for donuts. It was like trying to you know, quit drugs or something. Or, or booze. You tell yourself, don't think about booze. You think about booze, and you drink too much booze, and you feel terrible about booze, and then you want to comfort yourself with more booze. It was like trying to not sin which makes you think about your sin, <laughs> which makes you obsessed with your, your, your sin, and yet sin is being obsessed with 
yourself and stuck on yourself, whereas love is losing yourself and finding yourself in another. Well, my point is that I was a soap addict, stuck in a downward spiral toward death and yet terrified of death. God is love, but I also knew he had to think about germs and poop and death, and so I washed my hands a lot, a lot. Wretched child that I was, who would deliver me from this body of germs? Well, thanks be to, to my dad. Seriously, if it weren't for my dad, I mean, without his help, I think they would have found my body in a few months or years, perhaps lying in a ditch somewhere outside Las Vegas, covered in open wounds, clutching a bar of soap. I remember one day walking out of my parents' bathroom having fought the good fight, trying to do what the good doctor told me to do. Looking for support, my dad was standing at the sink with a note of victory in my voice. I said, Daddy, Daddy, guess what? He said, what, buddy? I said, I just went number two, and I didn't even wash my hands. I remember he looked at me, and he got this smile, like from ear to ear. He just beamed at me and said, oh, buddy. I am so proud of you. <laughs> My hands healed, but I still lived in terror at the thought that I might have to one day clean a toilet. I, I think maybe that's why I got married. One of the reasons. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I wasn't really healed of my poo neurosis till August 26, 1988. And I suppose that I'm still neurotic, not so much about actual poop, but metaphorical poop. I really do struggle with nervousness about what I've done wrong and that I, that I don't know how to judge what I've done wrong and what I've done right. And then I get pretty nervous because I'm convinced that all of that judging is probably wrong. I mean, I'm always worried that I've messed things up and, and then uh, trying to clean things up, I make an even bigger mess. I worry that I may have sinned just one too many times and then I worry that I don't really believe that I'm forgiven, you know, for worrying and that really worries me. And then I think, crap. I'm a pastor. I have to talk about God. And yet I have such a hard time understanding God, let alone obeying God. Maybe I should just shut up about God. And you see, that's not just anal retentive. That's gospel retentive. They say Nikolai Tesla was utterly neurotic about germs. Michael Jackson slept in a hyperbaric chamber Howard Hughes became so obsessed with germs, he would only pick things up using tissue paper. Uh, he was afraid to eat food because of the germs in the food, and he basically died alone. It wasn't germs, but his fear of germs and his religious devotion to saving himself from germs that, that killed him. The dictionary defines neurosis as an excessive or irrational anxiety but is mysophobia, that's one word for it, or germophobia, or poophobia, or thanatophobia, thanatophobia, death phobia, is that excessive or irrational? Because we really do live in a world infected with disease and germs and refuse. Death is always one heartbeat away. You could be dead by the end of the service, plunging headlong into the void of decay, non-being, and perhaps something even worse. You could find yourself standing before the throne of the righteous judge of all creation. So, so you better get your crap together. I mean, how many people, <coughs> how many people die of infectious disease every year? <coughs> ah, sorry. So who's insane and who's sane? Is God sane? You know, if you read the Old Testament, especially like Leviticus, Numbers, the, the ritual laws on cleanliness, God will make Howard Hughes look pretty sane. Deuteronomy chapter 23, God gives the Israelites elaborate instructions on relieving themselves outside the camp because God walks inside the camp and God is holy. In the law, there are 
pages and pages and pages on ritual cleanliness. And, and for God, bodily excreta, human bodily excreta, appears to be like one of the worst forms of uncleanliness or, or maybe the physical expression of the worst form of uncleanliness. Excreta is, is like the physical manifestation of a deep, deep spiritual problem called sin. So just as our physical bodies eat food, which is always a form of life. Think about that. Just as our physical bodies eat life and poop, death, decay, and disease, so our psychic bodies take life from those around us. Our psychic bodies take life and excrete death, and we call that sin. And no matter how much we try to deny it with restroom stalls, scented bath products, polite conversation, no matter how religious we get about our devotion to cleanliness, and no matter how much we try to clean up our mess, the more we just seem to make a mess. So even if we don't constantly wash our hands of excrement, we constantly try to wash our souls of sin kind of just like the ghost of Pontius Pilate or that legend that he continually washes his hands and the more he washes his hands, the more dirty, 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 dirty does his soul get. May 2nd, 1507, a young German priest was officiating at his very first communion. When he got to the portion where he was to say this, we offer unto thee the living, true, eternal God, but at that point he froze. He was stricken with terror. His father, Hans, glared in disapproval. The monk trembled, spilling the blood, barely hanging on to the bread. Later he wrote this, At these words I was utterly stupefied and terror-stricken. Who am I that I should lift up mine eyes or raise my hands to the divine majesty? At his nod the earth trembles, and shall I say, I want this, or I ask for that? For I am dust and ashes and full of sin, and I am speaking to the living, eternal, and the true God. For the experience, he had a word, a German word, on It was the way he described the anxiety, despair, and the shame which he felt before the righteous God. The official stance of the church at that time was that at baptism, a person is forgiven of original sin, but after baptism, a person still needs to seek absolution through confession and penance for each and every sin, or risk torment for a time in purgatory, or perhaps endless wrath in a place of endless wrath called hell. And so this young monk sought to cleanse himself each and every day in the Roman Catholic confessional. One day, he spent six hours just confessing the sins of the previous day. And he did not live in Las Vegas, he lived in a monastery. Finally, his confessor just yelled at him saying this, look here, if you expect Christ to forgive you, come in with something to forgive. Murder, blasphemy, adultery, instead of all these little sins. But this young monk knew, little or big, the punishment was death. And with God, little always seemed to be big, right? I mean, Jesus even said, just a thought could be murder, adultery, blasphemy. He'd been trained as a lawyer, and so he understood that if the great commandment were to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, uh, then the opposite of that, the great sin is to not love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But the harder he worked at loving God, the less he did love God. So the very commandment that promised life proved to be death to him. One day in anguish he cried out, love God, I hate him. And so his neurosis over sin led him to commit the worst of sins, trying to love God, he wanted to kill God maybe even crucify God, if you will. Of course, the name of that young monk, as you may have guessed, was Martin Luther. You know, many academics think that he was mentally ill. In college at CU, I had to do a paper on Eric Erickson's thesis that um, Luther's great moment of revelation regarding salvation by grace through faith was somehow the product of a successful anal release in the Wittenberg Tower on what 
Erickson surmised to be a toilet in a, a restroom. Psychohistorians have argued that Luther's real issues were with his father Hans and potty training. And, and I, can, I can tell you from experience that potty train is, potty train is rather stressful. This is a picture of my son John and my daughter Elizabeth long about 1990. Potty training was especially stressful for Jonathan because, you know, he was our first. He was the, the pioneer. John was such a, a, happy, uh, a happy little kid, and our home was like a Garden of Eden, a little Garden of Eden, until he gained the knowledge that Poopoo and Petey, Peepee belong in the potty. I remember peeking around the corner one day to see Jonathan talking to his Bambi doll with tears in his eyes. He said, Bambi, I can't go pee-pee in the potty. Can you go pee-pee in the potty? We put a toy fire engine on top of the potty, promising that it would be his if and when he did the deed in the potty. But I, I think it just added to the stress, and thus to the accidents, and thus the condemnation that he felt, and thus the desire to hide his dirty underwear and his anxious soul from, from me. Psychohistorians argue that Luther's real issues were with his father Hans and potty training. But Luther would argue that his real issues were with his father God and, and sin. Well, maybe Luther wasn't insane. Maybe he was more sane than anyone in all of Germany at the time, and yet maybe Martin really did experience a release on the throne or from the throne. I mean, maybe it's somehow all related. Whatever the case, Martin Luther's release sparked the Reformation. And we know that it happened while he was reading the book of Romans. <laughs> We've been studying Romans for six months now, and today we come to one of his most controversial sections. As usual, the portions in brackets up on the screen uh, uh, suggest the more literal translation. And when you see a word with a line through it, it doesn't mean that the word's not true. It, it just means that I'm saying it's not as literally accurate. Sometimes it's not even there in the Greek text, okay? So this is Romans 7, verse 5. For while we were in the flesh... Our sinful passions, more commonly translated sufferings, our, our sinful sufferings aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for the death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive so that we serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the written code. Now, Paul isn't saying that living by the Spirit is simply a new way. He's saying that the way of the Spirit is always new. It's always now, living by the Spirit. And living by the law is always old. And it's actually not living, for when you live by the law, you are not free to live in the now, for you constantly judge the now with knowledge that's been taken from the past. Verse 7. What then shall we say, that the law is sin? Hell no, or by no means. Yet if it had not been for law, I would not have known the sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet, epithumia, or desire. It's a certain type of desire. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, uh, worked or produced in me all kinds of desire, covetousness. For apart from law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from law, but when the commandment came, the sin came alive, and I died. The very commandment that promised the life proved to be death to me. For the sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. I was once alive apart from law. That one sentence drives Western Christian theologians, maybe not Eastern Orthodox theologians, but Western theologians, crazy. Crazy because of Augustine's fourth century doctrine of original sin, which is the idea that we all inherit guilt from Adam. But as we've seen in Scripture, people don't inherit guilt, which is death. They inherit flesh. 
which leads people to sin and is death. Well, people naturally then ask, when was Paul alive apart from the law or law? In other words, when did Paul not have guilt? Paul writes, I was once alive apart from law. He doesn't use the word, the article the in the manuscript, and, and I think that's because he probably isn't only talking about the Mosaic law, but just law, which is what? It's knowledge of good and evil that's taken and then written down in a book or perhaps written on a stone or placed in the human psyche. I was once alive apart from law. Many commentators think Paul is talking as if he were Adam, but then they struggle for they think Paul cannot be Adam, for Adam sinned in this garden long ago. But as we've seen, Paul did think he was Adam, for Adam means humanity, and the garden in Scripture is far more than simply a historical piece of land somewhere in the past in, in Israel. The garden shows up on Mount Zion, right, where Jesus is crucified on the tree in the garden, and where he is enthroned on the Ark of the Covenant between the cherubim in the temple, and the, the garden exists now, exists now in the heart of an eternal temple that comes down upon Mount Zion in the form of the New Jerusalem, and the garden exists here and now in the temple of your soul. Karl Barth argues that Paul is referring to that timeless age to which all men belong. And I, I think he may be on to something there. But I suspect that Paul is quite simply referring to that time when he was a little boy. Like my son John, before he gained the knowledge of potties and poo-poo. In chapter 5, Paul wrote this. Sin is not counted where there is no law. And for infants, there is no law, right? For they have not yet taken knowledge uh, from the tree, the fruit from the tree. The Old Testament makes it clear that little children do not yet have the knowledge of good and evil. And yet they all seem to get the knowledge of good and evil. Why? Well, because we give it to them. And they also take it, I think, uh, from a tree in the sanctuary of their own soul. I love this picture because you can see it on their faces. One of them has taken from the tree, and one of them has not taken from the tree, but soon will. Mom had a law. No playing with the makeup bag. John knew the law, and so you can see it in his face. We're busted, I'm ashamed, and I wanna hide. Elizabeth could not yet comprehend the law, and so she's thinking, this is great, come play with us, daddy. <laughs> every parent knows that their children must come to know about good and evil, and yet every parent mourns the day that they do. It's the day a child begins to judge themselves. It's the day that a child begins to be self-conscious. It's the day they start trying to be cute, and so they stop being so cute. It's the day they begin to act good, and so then they suddenly struggle to be good. It's the day they begin to hide. They hide their heart, and they hide their poop. They start to die. You may have noticed that Paul mentioned two deaths in the verses that we just read. The first death in verse 9 was the day that he gained the knowledge of good and evil as if he took knowledge of the good from the tree, and when he did, the life died. The second death in verse 7 was the day he received the Spirit of Christ as if Christ gave his life on the tree, and Paul inherited the good like a seed in the dirty, shitty, fertile soil of his broken heart. The first death was separation from the life. The second death was the death of death, which is communion with the life, eternal life. Now, you don't have to understand this. <laughs> if this isn't your bag, but I find this utterly fascinating that physicists now do not understand, or they do not understand why time only moves in one direction. And the only way they can recognize that direction is that things decay in that direction. It's called the second law of thermodynamics. It's the observation that things always move towards death and decay in a closed system. 
You see, the moment that Adam took the fruit, he became a closed system. And yet the moment you surrender the fruit and receive the life is the moment time is filled with eternity and we each become who it is that we truly are. It's the moment we begin to wake from a nightmare. It's the death of death. I think it's also called faith. It's the presence of the promised seed. And, and ironically, think about this. This would mean that the fear of death actually is insanity. <laughs> For you're already dead. You already died the first death, and the second death will set you free. So Paul writes, verse 10, the very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. You know, the Father's commandment, according to the word Jesus in John chapter 12, is eternal life. That means the life of the age to come. That's God's commandment, says Jesus. If you hear the commandment as a law, which you must fulfill, well, then it kills you. Well, actually, I correct that. It already has killed you. But if you hear the commandment as a life that fully fills you, the effect is just the opposite. It's not desecration, it's creation. The death of death, life. Well, verse 11, for the sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is the good then bring death to me? This is important to remember. It was God that grew that tree in the middle of the garden. It was God that wrote the law in the stone and handed it to Moses. It was God that predestined the death of Jesus Christ on that tree in that garden. And remember, God is the good, and his word is the life. Verse 13, did that which is the good then bring death to me? By no means. It was the sin producing or working death in me through what is the good in order that the sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, having been sold under the sin. Now let me just mention, God did not sell Paul. Because Paul's going to go on and tell us in chapter 11 that God does not enter into transactional relationships with anyone. However, Paul did sell Paul. Paul sold himself the day he believed the lion started taking knowledge to justify himself, the day he slaved himself to the snake. Verse 15, for I do not know, I do not understand my own actions, my works, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree. Well, I agree with the law that it's good. So now it is no longer I who do it, who work it, but the sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do the good, but not the ability uh, to carry it out, to work it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I who do it. <laughs> it's no longer I who work it but sin that dwells within me. Now, I wish at this point we had a chance to review all of the 20 sermons we've preached so far in Romans, but we don't, we don't. So suffice it to say that I am trapped in me, and so are you. You are a spirit trapped in a body of flesh that is dead and dying. You're the breath of God trapped in a psyche that you have constructed in an attempt to justify yourself. That thing that we usually refer to as an ego. You are that and so am I. So I, I like the idea of love. I really do. That's why, I, that's the thing you like in every movie you go to see. I like the idea of love, but I find that I'm unable to love because I'm worried about me. <laughs> That is myself, my psyche, compared to other psyches, but love is losing my psyche and finding it in another. So I'm a breath trapped in an earthen vessel. I'm a spirit trapped in a, a closed system, a body of flesh. But if I was part of another body, I wouldn't be my own prison. 
I wouldn't stink. I'm, maybe I'm weird, but I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but my finger, which is a member of my body, doesn't poop into my hand. And my hand doesn't poop into my finger. Or at least we don't think of it that way. Instead, there's like a river of life that flows between my hand and my finger. And the river carries away what we consider to be waste, and it brings life. But it's all, it's all one life, a common life. So, so just think if all creation were one life, under one head, then nothing would be wasted. There would be no pain, but only eternal ecstatic pleasure for each and for all. Wait, wait, verse 20. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law, literally. So then I find the law that when I want to do the good, the evil lies close at hand. For I delight, but this verb for delight is fascinating. Sunadomei, it's two words together. Sun, which means with, and hedone, where we get our word hedonism. So it, it literally means to have pleasure with. For I have pleasure with someone in the law, or maybe with the law, as if the law were alive, I have pleasure with in the law of God in my inner man. Now that is an utterly fascinating statement because Paul writes as if there is a new and inner man, a new me within his old man, his old me. And within this, within this new man, his spirit, his eye, communes in delight with another spirit, <laughs> which is the spirit, it must be, of I am. You know, the law is a description of I am. It's knowledge about I am, but love is I am. Love is the life of I am, communing with you in the sanctuary of your soul, not knowledge of God, but God knowing you, which produces fruit in you, fruit that is the true you, constructed of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, the good, and faith in place of faithlessness, evil, unkindness, impatience, anxiety, despair, and apathy. It's growing. Verse 22, for I have pleasure with someone in the law of God, uh, in my inner man, but I see in my members another law, waging a war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of the sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of the death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, Paul thinks that Jesus actually is the promised seed. Jesus is the life of love descended into this body of death. Jesus is the living law, rising from the dead in the sanctuary of your soul. The faith within you is Christ in you. Verse 25, so then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Now that sentence drives the religious crowd absolutely bonkers, because it sounds like irresponsibility, which technically it is. It drives them nuts, because Paul is not writing, you see, because of that, but Paul is also not writing in the past tense. He says this is what's happening now as if he had all these, um, it's not as if he had all these problems with sin, but now he's got religion and the struggle is over. Religious folks like to think that Paul is describing his life before conversion to Christianity. And they'll go to elaborate links to kind of twist this to say that Paul is describing something in, in the past. But Martin Luther saw that what human, saw what human religion doesn't want us to see. Luther saw that sin is a problem just far bigger than human religion, any human religion could ever fix. For what is religion? Isn't it just taking more knowledge of good and evil so that we can apply it to ourselves in the power of the flesh in the hopes of justifying ourselves even as we condemn our neighbors? See, when, when we try to clean ourselves up with the knowledge of good and evil, we only make ourselves more dirty. For evil is the lie that you are your own creator, your own savior, and your own redeemer. I have a friend that was just horrifically abused 
As we prayed for her late one evening years ago, she had this memory that Jesus walked her back into of being shamed in the most horrific of ways. And so she suddenly began to like frantically scrub her face with her hands as if to cleanse it. And I remember I grabbed her and I said, honey, you can't clean yourself. And when she stopped, she looked up at me and she said, yeah, Jesus just told me I only make myself more dirty. <laughs> Luther saw that we're not only saved by grace through faith, but that we're sanctified by grace through faith. We're even created by grace through faith. And it happens through a lifetime of worshiping Jesus in the sanctuary of your soul. It takes a lifetime of surrendering your old man at the throne and then putting on the new man. It takes a lifetime of worship at the foot of the cross where Jesus is enthroned in the temple of your soul. We see it just makes sense to me that Martin Luther was actually sitting on the toilet in the Wittenberg Tower reading the book of Romans when he first perceived the truth that sparked the Reformation. Romans 1.17, the righteous live by faith. Later he wrote this. Then I grasped that the justice of God is that righteousness by which through grace and sheer mercy God justifies us through faith. Thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. The whole of Scripture took on a new meaning. Whereas before the justice of God had filled me with hate, now it became to me inexpressibly sweet in greater love. This it is to behold God in faith, that you should look upon his fatherly, friendly heart in which there is no anger or ungraciousness. He who sees God as angry does not see him rightly, because, but looks only on a, on a curtain, as if a dark cloud had been drawn across his face. You know, Luther speculated that his grace just might be effective for all. But sadly, he and the other reformers, like Zwingli and Calvin, became part of powerful political entities, the principalities and powers of this world. And so they and their followers began to argue that this grace was for their group and not other groups, not all. But Paul clearly taught all. Well, verse 24, he writes, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this the body of the death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Next verse. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How do we know that we're in Christ Jesus? or that the Spirit of Christ Jesus is in us. In a few verses, Paul will write this, Romans 8, 15. When we cry, Abba, Daddy, when we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit, like two spirits communing, bearing witness uh, with our spirit that we are the children of God. Okay, that was a lot of stuff. <laughs> so what does this mean for your germophobia? For your sin phobia, your spiritual neurosis, and all your addictions, including your religious addictions? In other words, what do you do with all your sins? Because they really are a problem. What do you do with all your sins? What do you do with all your crap? How do you ever get clean and stop pooping your own pants? Because you can't live free with pooping your pants. About the time that this picture was taken, my wonderful wife obtained this book titled Potty Training in a Day. She told me to read it. Then she left me alone with John and Elizabeth. I, I remember Elizabeth being there. She disputes that fact, but she left me alone uh, with, with John and Elizabeth and she went shopping. She thought I should train John since we shared similar equipment. According to the book, I was to take John to the throne, the potty, that you can see there in the background in this picture. You can also see that's been getting some action. You can see that this was not a job for the faint of heart. 
Well, I was to take John to the potty once he had an accident, and together we were to put the poo-poo in the potty for, you know, that's where the poo-poo goes. So I waited until I sensed that there had been an accident and my son was trying to hide. I, I found him. I took him by the hand. I led him to the bowl. I stood him there in front of the throne. He was wearing nothing, nothing but pull-ups in this little clean white T-shirt. I remember I pulled the loaded pull-ups down, you know, to his ankle, fully loaded, and just then I turned to get some paper and to keep little Elizabeth from crawling into the fray. I remember I turned like this, and, and I turned back just in time to see this. John looked this way, then he looked that way, then he bent down, and he grabbed the visible expression of his sin nature right out of the pulpit. He stood up, and he just hucked it at the ball. It bounced off of the lid into the ball. Woohoo! Two points! And then I remember he turned and looked at me with those beautiful big eyes smiling ear to ear as he took his hand and just wiped it across his clean white shirt. <laughs> I'll never forget the way he looked at me because there was such delight in his eyes as if to say, Daddy, Daddy, aren't you proud of me? And this is what I want you to understand. I was. I had everything that I wanted in that moment. I had the heart of my son. <laughs> my son, covered in filth, but full of faith. You see, it was never really about the filth. It's always about the faith. I mean, we would so work on getting the poopoo in the potty, and there would be setbacks like the time that he grew convinced that flames would come up through the pipe and burn him when he sat on the potty. Or the time he was so distracted by all the toys at Walmart, had an accident, then looked at me with those eyes and said, but you're still proud of me, aren't you, Daddy? <laughs> and I had to say, oh yeah, John, absolutely, I'm proud of you. I'm not so fond of your poop, John, but I'm infinitely fond of you, the pooper. So I looked at him that day, standing in front of the bull, wiping his poop on his shirt, and he looked at me, and we smiled. We smiled from ear to ear. I think it may be my uh, favorite memory of my son from those days. <laughs> so yeah, we would still need to work on the details of getting the poo, poo in the potty, but I could handle the mess. You see, that really was not a problem for me. Actually, I got over my poo phobia the day my son was born, August 26, 1988. Poo poo really is not a problem. But I would, I would die to earn the trust of, of my son. And so I'm actually grateful for all of his poo poo, because <laughs> it's a way that I can do just that. He looked at me, I looked at him, and in that moment, my spirit connected with his spirit, and we rejoiced together. And that's what you do with your sins. So you don't hide them. You know, you really don't even try to fight them. What you need to fight is the liar and his lie that you must justify yourself, save yourself, sanctify yourself, cleanse yourself. So don't hide your sins. You know, you really don't even need to struggle with your sins. I mean, that's what makes an even bigger mess. Instead, take your sins to the throne, and along with the Spirit of Jesus resident inside of you right now, look into the eyes of your Father. I looked at John. John looked at me. And what did he see? I imagine... It was not just John that was covered with poo-poo that day. <laughs> Paul writes, God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. They crucified Jesus naked. But I bet you he was just covered with spit and shit and your shame. And that was all according to plan, to plan, to plan. 
For that's how he gains our trust. That's how he creates our faith. He wants you to see how much he loves you. We love because he first loved us. And love fully fills, it fulfills the law, the entire law. So on that night that we all did our worst, he did his best. He took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. And in the same manner, he took the cup and he said, this is the covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. So if you would, just close your eyes for a minute. You're standing before the throne. That's where you are. And you're covered in filth. It comes from your flesh. It happens because you're stuck on yourself. And you think you have to fix yourself with more of yourself. It's shame and anxiety and despair, addictions, self-centered desire. Even your good works are as filthy rags, says the prophet Isaiah. You're standing before the throne. Now look at your father. Now in your mind's eye, he may look like Jesus. Or he may look like someone that's loved you well. You know, love in human flesh is Jesus. It's his body. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. Look at your father and say, Daddy, if you looked at him, I bet you he's smiling from ear to ear. Because you see that look, even if it's just like the size of a little seed, that look is called faith. And that's what he wants. And now you can smile too. You can even laugh. Of course he has issues with your poop. But that's only because he absolutely adores you, the pooper. He'll clean you up. Just keep looking at him and say, Daddy. See, that's a different story than the world is telling. And that's why he calls you back to the throne time and time again to worship. And for me, what I said that that memory of my son is my, I mean, we have a lot of great memories. He's not dead. I didn't make sense that John's dead. But I think that's such an important memory for me, not because it was hilarious, but because that's who, who I am. I mean, this world is just so full of shit. It's on the people around you. It's all over you. But when I can stand before God and remember that that's who I am, I'm his son, and he delights in me. Well, it changes everything. 
And that's why he calls you back time and time again to his throne. So that you would be reminded. <laughs> well, of course he doesn't like the poop. It stinks. But he absolutely adores the pooper. And this is the amazing thing to me. Um, I have an entirely different attitude toward poop now. <laughs> I mean, I remember coming back uh, in the summers from California, and my mom and dad had like a diaper shrine in the garage. They wouldn't throw the kids' diapers away because they, you know, wanted to think about their kids. One day at school, the teacher asked Coleman, it was Sunday school, what's your mom's favorite thing to do on Mother's Day? And Coleman said, my mom's favorite thing to do is cleaning me up. And, uh, <laughs> and you see, that's true. So Paul says, God consigned all the disobedience in order they may have mercy on all. That means he allowed for all the poop. Because he wants to show you something in the midst of the poop. And that is that you are his and he is yours. And that's a treasure that's eternal. So in Jesus' name, believe the gospel. And if you'd like prayer, I noticed Ted, Ted's getting married later today. You're going to be here to pray for people, right? Yeah, okay, that's commitment, right? So look, we'll pull out the, we'll pull out the river, and uh, uh, we invite you to come and pray after the service if, if you'd like with Ted and the prayer team. All right, have a wonderful week. Believe the gospel, amen.